Well, tonight, the Harris County Medical Examiner is getting ready to dig up two graves of murder victims to finally reunite two brothers. Those boys were victims of Houston serial killer Dean Coral in the 1970s. And decades ago, one was misidentified. In Focus reporter Ted, Ob Ted Ober takes a look back to see how they arrived at this disturbing discovery. Dean Coral's been dead since the early 70s, and yet somehow, from the grave, Houston's worst serial killer still finds new ways to haunt families. He raped them, ended up killing them, brought them down here and buried them. Coral's story unfolded for days on TV in 1973, after his accomplice, Elmer Wayne Henley, killed Coral and led police to 27 graves all over Houston. And as the digging continued, more and more bodies were uncovered. According to Henley, the victims had been lured to parties at Coral's home, drugged, tied to torture boards, sometimes for days, repeatedly raped and eventually killed. Police were able to identify most of the decomposing bodies. They were all teenage boys, among them two brothers, Michael and Billy Balk. The brothers were just two of Dean Coral's more than two dozen victims. And for 37 years, their families thought that the brothers were buried here side by side in the same grave at Woodlawn Cemetery. But as it turns out, one of those brothers was misidentified and has been here in an unmarked pauper's grave at the Harris County Public Cemetery all that time. It was quite a surprise because the identifications back in the day, even with what they had available to work with, were very good. And we really had no idea there might be one that was not strong. It was just kind of one of those, oh my gosh, moments. For the last few years, the Harris County Medical Examiner's anthropology experts have been looking at these old cases with the help of new DNA testing abilities. When they started comparing old case notes on the cases with old evidence, they realized the identity mistake. They will now have to exhume bodies from two cemeteries to reunite a family and hopefully figure out who the unknown victim is. We don't know. Um, we have a few names that we have sort of been working on over time that we have not been able to find family to tell us whether that boy is really missing or not. The medical examiner credits a reporter, Barbara Gibson, who helped dig through some of these files and uncover some evidence. We have a link to one of her articles on our website. The medical examiner hopes to exhume those bodies sometime in October. In Focus, Ted Oberg. Tonight, 13. Ted Oberg investigates a new clue from a 40-year-old serial murder that rocked Houston. It is a tough photograph to see, and you may not want young viewers to watch it. But investigators still on this case need your help as they delve into the clue from the murder Time forgot. This entire story of sadistic homosexual slayings would almost appear to be fiction. Some of the people who went in were carried out in plastic bags. And he raped them, ended up killing them, brought them down here and buried them. Shovels digging into dirt and yielding bodies. But it's not fiction. It's very real. And you think most of these victims are young boys? I'm pretty reasonably sure they are. There could be dozens of other bodies. If TV cameras hadn't been there to capture every bit of it... Now listed as one of the most horrifying crimes in this century. These mass murders would have seemed too gruesome to believe. Here's your lines right here. This month, the Houstonians decided to retell the story. Action. Houstonian Josh Vargas is directing a film dramatizing the Dean Coral killings. The gruesome murder of 29 boys and young men that we know of. Wayne wouldn't pronounce the word gone like gone, he'd pronounce it like gone. Vargas spent years through. studying the murder so spree, the eventually visiting Coral's accomplice, Elmer Wayne Henley, repeatedly in prison. You got this kid who starts off as somebody whose friends are disappearing and nobody knows why, to somebody who's actively involved with the people who are doing the disappearing to somebody who actually ends it all. And to me, that was where the story lied. Because the jailhouse meetings with Henley led Vargas and his production partner, Rick Staten, to Henley's mother and eventually to Henley's personal belongings. I never said there were 30 people. After Henley confessed, his mother boxed up Elmer's stuff and stuffed those boxes in the back of a school bus in an overgrown North Texas field where it's been for decades. We are the first people who went through that stuff in 40 years. From the back of that bus, Vargas pulled out Henley's actual clothes for his actors to wear, Henley's actual posters to decorate the set with. But that's not why we're telling you about Josh Vargas's find. Sitting in the back of that bus, at the bottom of a rotting cardboard box in a sealed photo envelope, was a 40-year-old snapshot that shook Vargas. 
while rummaging through those pictures, this uh, Polaroid falls out. And I take a look at it, and right off the bat, having studied the case and the crime scene photos and everything, I see Dean's toolbox, and I see his implements in that box, and I see this kid right here uh, with handcuffs on his arms. I sat there, and I looked at this picture for about 30 minutes, and then I showed it to my wife. I was like, look at this and tell me what you think that is. A gruesome instant Polaroid. That is a boy who was horrified, who was laying on a floor. Likely snapped an instant before the teen was sexually tortured and likely killed. And even though it's never been seen before, it's not worth telling you about just because he found it. Wayne obviously took the picture. Of the the reason Josh wants you to see this photograph is the same reason the Harris County Medical Examiner wants you to see it. And it's because no one knows who it is. It's 40 years old, slightly out of focus, blurred by old technology then and time now. But the Harris County Medical Examiner doesn't think it is any of the known victims. And according to the anthropologist working on the case, it's not the one set of unidentified remains. Since Dean Quarrel never let a victim escape alive, there's only one thing it could be. I believe it's a victim that they don't know about. I don't see how it could be anything else. A young boy, gone for 40 years, forgotten by a city who wanted to put these murders behind them, and overlooked by detectives who decades ago closed this case. Wayne, get up. Even if we abandon the film project today, the greatest news we could get would be that at least something came of this, right. that maybe somebody will recognize their son, brother. In a prison conversation, Josh Vargas asked Elmer Wayne Henley about that photograph, and Henley says he has no idea who the young boy is, but does believe there are victims yet to be discovered. Lending some authenticity to the photograph, it does seem to match crime scene photos from inside Dean Quarles' home at the time. And it was likely taken in 1972 or 1973, since that's about the time Elmer Wayne Henley got his Polaroid camera. If you know who that young boy is, the medical examiner desperately needs to hear from you. Ted Oberg, 13 Eyewitness News. And as you heard Ted report, the medical examiner's office tells us it tried to match the photo to all known victims, and there's no match. They do want to hear from you, though. We put the picture and the number to the ME's office on ABC 13. Exclusive details now in the case involving one of Houston's most notorious serial killers. More than 30 years later, the bodies of two of the victims are being exhumed. Eyewitness News reporter Ted Oberg is live from the medical examiner's office. Ted? Gina, we were the only reporters there today as anthropologists unearthed two sets of remains today from Woodlawn Cemetery. They know who one is, and they are working now to figure out who the second is and trying to answer these 38-year-old questions about just who Dean Quarrel killed. Like a lot of teenage boys in the 1970s, Michael Balk had long hair, and his mother didn't like it. His hair was down here. His mother told him it needed to be up here. But before her son returned from the barbershop, he was picked up and killed by notorious Houston serial killer Dean Coral. Balk's brother Billy was one of Coral's victims, too, and the family thought the brothers were buried here in the same casket decades ago. In all, Coral killed 28 teenage boys in the 1970s, making headlines across the state as his victims were dug up. Anthropologist Dr. Sharon Derrick, then an Austin teenager, remembers reading about it. What I really remember is opening up the newspaper one morning at home and seeing this front page huge photo of them pulling the remains out of the boat shed. Decades later, she came to work at the Harris County Institute for Forensic Science, where among her jobs was trying to name still unidentified Dean Coral victims. I feel like in some way I'm helping take care of these boys now. She realized her predecessors made a mistake when some supposedly unidentified bones DNA matched a known victim already in the ground. It led her to the painful decision to dig up a 38-year-old grave, which was finally done today. Returning one brother to the grave, removing the second, now unidentified victim. Hopefully we'll be able to learn who this individual is and give that family an answer. She'll work to figure out who the unidentified remains are now. The brother who was thought to be here was actually in a cooler at the medical examiner's office all these years, and his remains are now buried in another cemetery. She was able to tell his family that he died after listening to his mother. An old police report showed the boy, eventually identified as Michael, died with short hair. Listened to his mother, went out and got his hair cut, just didn't come home. It will take months for anthropologists here to work up a biological profile of the unidentified remains they unearthed today. Then Dr. Derek hopes to match that profile 
with some of the short stack of missing persons reports she has from the 1970s when Dean Coral was killing his victims. Live at the Institute for Forensic Science in the Medical Center, I'm Ted Oper, 13 Owens News. They quit the investigation after 19, after they found the 28 and they found the two on the San Jacinto, they quit. They didn't want to find any more. You know, they didn't want to tell any more families their babies had been killed. For 40 years, a serial murder case has haunted Houstonians, but tonight a would-be victim tells a survival story that has haunted him his whole life. To this day, there are still unidentified and even unknown victims of serial killer Dean Coral and his two counterparts. Tonight we hear from a man who thinks he may have been one of them. Eyewitness News reporter Ted Ober investigates. Dad has so many pictures. Brett Ashworth's memory of that day is hidden nearly as deep as his father's old pictures from that era. Baby pictures. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. But he's digging it up okay. 41 years later. This is what I looked like in 1971. There I am right there. That's when it happened. That's when I'm 11. A deadly conspiracy now listed as one of the most horrifying crimes in this century. It was a time in Houston when dozens of young boys were disappearing. And you think most of these victims are young boys? I'm pretty reasonably sure they are. Surprisingly, no one really noticed until at least 29 of them turned up dead at the hands of a single serial killer. Nobody had any idea. And I didn't know until I saw it on the news. Around that time, 11-year-old Brett was hitchhiking in the heights to a friend's house. A white van stopped to pick him up. I basically started getting in the van. And what kept me from going in the van is I heard a mumbling sound. Like somebody... And I was like, hey, this ain't supposed to sound like this. So I said, no, nah, man, it's all right. The driver... One of that serial killer's accomplices wouldn't let him go, and Brett fought back. He grabbed my right hand. He tried to jerk me in the van, and when he did, I was left-handed, and I always carried a knife. So when he had me by the hand, I was able to hit him with that, and that's when he just went, ah, and he let go. Back in 1971, when it happened here on the streets of the Heights, Brett didn't really tell anyone about it, not his parents or the police or anyone. But that day a few years later that Elmer Wayne Henley was caught and he confessed, that's when Brett saw the one clue that helped him put all the pieces together. It was Wayne Henley who grabbed me. You're sure of that? I'm positive. You can look at the scar on his hand today. How, how can you be so positive? That I know it was him because I looked him right in the eye when he pulled me. And I saw him in handcuffs the day that he was like this. And I looked down and I said, what the hell? And I, I opened the picture further and saw his face and I went, oh my God. And I said, no, that couldn't be him. And I looked at his hand. You can see the scar. And so can we, faintly in old film, but it's there and it's proof, Brett says, that at least someone got away from Elmer Wayne Henley. Proof that that little boy in the old photograph grew up to be a man who could tell the story. I have a feeling he killed over 50 children. I, I just, there was no remorse in this guy's eyes. He wanted to grab me and he didn't care how he did it. Ashworth got in touch with us when he saw word of a possible new victim from the coral killings on our newscast. We showed you the recently unearthed picture of a possible new victim last night. It's on our website, as is the phone number for the Harris County Medical Examiner who wants your help identify that old photograph. Ted Oberg, 13 Witch News.